All right, let's do this. If you got a copy of the Bible, if you would fast forward to the New Testament to Hebrews 13. Nearing the finish line in our Hebrews series, Hebrews 13. This morning's text will be verses 4 to verse 6. As you're finding your way there, let me remind you we're just a few days away from Thanksgiving. So while we don't talk about Bruno anytime, we don't talk about politics or religion at the Thanksgiving table, right? Those are the two topics that are sure to be off limits and create a fuss. Well, if you want to know what are the two topics that make every pastor squirm in the pulpit and every listener squirm in the pews, it's marriage and money. Our text this morning. Marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterers. Keep your life free from the love of money and be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Be warned, church, today's going to be a bit squirmy for us all. For some reason, about a year ago, it made sense to package these two topics together. And this week, as I've prepared, I thought, what in the world am I doing? So let's pray that the Lord will help me not make a mess of this text and you to be soft soil to receive God's word. Our Father, we do ask for those two things. We ask that you would guard my words from the many ways that I can make a mess of these verses. I pray that you would, uh, as your spirit is kind to do, that you would give precision to words such that uh, we would rightly balance the call to these behaviors, the outworking uh, of your gospel in our lives, that we would have the right tone of grace and truth here, that we would not load down with burden and condemnation. I pray that you would help me, and I pray that you would help my friends as they sit under your word. pray that you would give them receptive hearts in places where it feels like your spirit's really meddling with us, that rather than resisting that and pushing away from that, that we would be the kinds of people who are receptive to that and see uh, your word and your spirit's activity is for our good. So would you give us that uh, level of attentiveness this morning? We ask for Christ's sake. Amen. My world is expanding, and as such, I am trying to convince myself to understand and enjoy soccer. My desire, however, for the sport waned this week when someone invited me to watch a match and they advertised that the first touch happened at a certain time. Now, I've never heard the phrase first touch before, and I'll admit that's the most awkward way I've ever heard anybody describe a game beginning. And as they invited me to the first touch at 8 p.m., I had to make a mental substitution in my head. Oh, you mean kickoff, right? That's what you mean. You mean at 8 p.m. the teams start to play the game. Why didn't you just say that? Why did you say something odd like first touch at 8 p.m.? Now, the downside of not knowing anything about the sport, including what a phrase like first touch means, is I have no clue who is good. Some dude could come up to me and introduce himself and claim to be a world-class soccer player, and I would have no clue if they were actually good or not. But... If I sit and watch a match, I think that's what you call it, if I sit and watch a match, I could quickly discern who is actually good, right? It wouldn't take long at all. You simply sit back and watch them play. There might be some unique uh, goals or passes or shots, and forgive me if I get all these words jumbled, I don't really know what I'm saying, but there, there, there might be all sorts of things that happen that tell me that this guy or gal was really amazing, but it, honestly, it wouldn't even take that, just watching them play. You could observe how someone moves on the field. You could watch how they dribble or pass or position themselves to take a shot. And there would be basic telltale signs of 
whether or not someone actually understood and mastered the game of soccer. Same is true in life. There are certain actions, particularly among the Christian community, that are just a dead giveaway as to whether someone actually understands the gospel. They're, they're just certain basics that, that you will observe someone whose heart is really captured by the magnificence of Jesus. They're just going to do. And they're going to give evidence to the reality of the gospel they espouse. Some 20 years ago, I had a seminary professor who drew it up this way, and it's stuck with me since. He said, we can kind of conceptualize any Christian behavior this way. Your stated belief plus your actual practice tells us what you actually believe. Your stated belief combined with what you actually do tells us what you actually actually really believe. The point's simple, right? What you do says much more about what you believe to be true about God and about God's word, world, I'm sorry, than simply what you say. Or, positioned negatively, say all the right things about who God is and what he's doing in the world, but live counter to those truths that you're espousing, and you don't really believe that thing. The paradigm is seen most vividly in two areas of life, how we love and how we give. Say what you will about God's love for you. Say what you will about God's care for you, your understanding of God's sovereignty and the ways you can nuance that discussion. But show that in how you love your spouse and how you use your money. These practices are the basics of Christianity. They show us what you actually believe to be true about God and his gospel. One of my main goals in preaching each week is to equip you to be really good Bible readers. So if my handy screen works here, yep, great. If you're reading this passage, we, we really have just simple verses, and they're pretty concrete in terms of their activity. But it, as, you're, as you're reading, I hope you, you noticed the, the phrase that I think is... Um, kind of an organizing thought to this unit. It links what comes before it, and it links what comes after it. And it's this idea right here. Be satisfied with what you had. I want you to notice how that phrase, that language, points us back to what's come before, and it points us forward to what's coming next. So marriage, be satisfied with what you had with what you have. Said negatively, we could frame it this way. Don't seek satisfaction in someone else. Frame positively, cultivate singular affection for your spouse. Be satisfied with what you have. Be satisfied with what you have pointing forward to stuff. Don't consume your stuff. Don't get obsessed with it. Frame positively. Cultivate a generous stewardship of your resources. Be satisfied with what you have. So here's the, here's the progression, I think, at, at play in this text. First, God gives good gifts to his kids. That, that progresses in our hearts to God's kids find satisfaction in God's good gifts. Which then progresses one step further in our hearts. Finding satisfaction in God's good gifts protects us from seeking satisfaction somewhere else. Okay, hang with that progression with me, because I think that's where I want to anchor our thoughts this morning. God gives good gifts. It's kind of waterfall-esque. God gives good gifts to his kids. His kids find satisfaction in God's good gifts. And the satisfaction that we find in those good gifts protects us from seeking satisfaction elsewhere. Church, be satisfied with what you have. So let's, let's work on that progression. Let's work on it in, in reverse order for a minute. Or actually for the entirety of what we're going to do. Kind of backwards progression. So satisfaction in God's good gifts protects us from seeking satisfaction elsewhere. Brooke, could you put that kind of progression up there for me? Yeah, okay, so let's start at the bottom of the progression. Satisfaction with God's good gifts protects us from seeking satisfaction elsewhere. 
Notice in the passage in, in 4 through 6, in both cases, the speaker is warning in marriage and in money, he's, there's temptation to be dissatisfied and to look elsewhere for fulfillment. How does that play out in verse 4? In marriage, the language there is used specifically is to defile the marriage bed, right? I.e. to find satisfaction elsewhere. Defile, just on the surface, even translated into English, it's just a disgusting word, isn't it? And it's meant to be. Defiling is gross. It's the opposite of pure. The speaker is saying, don't bring impurity into the marriage bed. And then defile gets defined. Defile gets defined for us in the text. God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterer. So first word we have is kind of a bigger, bigger blanket term. It's overarching. Uh, the language there, the root word is porneia. It's where we get pornography from, obviously. It's a broad category for all forms of sexual immorality. And then it's listed here as a distinct term from adulterer. So it suggests to me that adultery is not the only way you can defile the marriage bed, right? So we have this broad category of porneia defined more specifically tip of the spear to adultery, but that's far from the only way. And friends, just because about half our church is single, I'll, I'll do this again at the end, but lest you think this is just something that married couples can do, friends, rest assured that singles in the church, there are scores of ways you can defile a marriage bed in the future, right, in these areas. So he says, don't indulge in, don't defile the marriage bed with sexual immorality and the tip of the spear, don't be an adulterer. Don't be one who is given to adultery. Don't give yourself to someone else. Don't do it physically and don't do it emotionally. Uh, to use the language of, the, of, of Paul and qualifications for adultery, uh, be a, a one, uh, one man woman and a one woman kind of man. And then the fruit of unrighteousness is applied to our money as well. Look in verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. The parallel is obvious. Don't love a woman outside of your marriage and don't love stuff that you don't have either. Don't love people that you don't have and don't love stuff that you don't have. Give yourself, notice verse 1, give yourself to brotherly love. Verse 4, give yourself to marital love, but don't give yourself to material love. Give yourself to brotherly love, give yourself to marital love, but don't, verse 5, don't give yourself to material love. Don't be excessively attached to what you wish you had. And friends, isn't this more subtle? It's really easy to know if you've had a sexual affair. It's far more subtle to define if you've got, you're having an affair with stuff. But each will eat your soul. And so he warns, don't, don't go there. And these areas, I mean, the, we could spend the rest of our time together cross-referencing this notion. Because it, it's everywhere in the Bible. The area of sexual sin is precisely defined as the main brunt of our sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4. This is God's will, your sanctification, linked idea that you keep yourself away from sexual immorality. Like the first thing that comes to Paul's mind when he says your sanctification is your sexual habits. Because each one of you has to know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. When working out the implications of the gospel to the church in Ephesus and to the church in Colossae, Paul links these ideas. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or any greed should not be heard among you as is proper for the saints. Again, in Colossians 3, and I actually think all of these phrases could be packaged as sexual sin and material sin. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, 
and greed, which is idolatry, the love of stuff. And throughout the Bible as well, to these kind of twin tower vices, we have dire warnings of the consequences. Think Proverbs 6. Can a man embrace fire and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on burning coals without scorching his feet? So it is with the one who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Or Paul writing in 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into a temptation, into a trap. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. None of us are surprised to read these warnings. We know the warnings are true, Christian, and yet many times, many days, we struggle to heed them. And often the voice is so heavy on the things that we are to avoid, and rightly so, that I, I, I fear we tend to underestimate a really key variable in this conversation and this, this language here. It's this, the preventative power of the positive. The preventative power of the positive. Too often, I fear, in the church, the voice can consistently ring out, avoid sexual sin and avoid greed. And that is good and right, and we should preach that. But I want you to notice how the Hebrews text is calling us. It's not merely don't do, but rather it's give yourself to some things. The preventative power of the positive. Cultivate singular affection for your spouse, and you'll be far less likely to give yourself to someone else. Cultivate generous stewardship of your resources, and you'll be far less likely to be consumed with stuff. Prevent destruction by bending yourselves to the positive power of the good. I heard uh, one, of the area, one of the area pastors at Grace Church in town make this point years ago, and it struck with me. He was comparing the, the dissipation of energy and sexual sin to the meandering of a river like, you know, like the mighty Mississippi. You cross it, and it, it seems like the water's just like oozing. It barely moving. And you look over the bridge, and it's filled with all sorts of junk and contamination and sediment and disgusting. You compare that to a river approaching a mighty waterfall. The water is channeled. It's directed. It's moving somewhere. The energy is so overwhelming that you have to warn onlookers, hey, don't get close because you might slip and go over. Singular affection channels our energy towards an appropriate source. And it protects us from puddles of stagnant water in our hearts that gather all sorts of disgusting debris. Channel your energy, your sexual life, your material investments toward appropriate sources such that the energy is not dissipated. Which brings us up the ladder to idea number two. God's people find satisfaction in his good gifts. Satisfaction is protective. So we've got to think about this notion. What does it mean to be satisfied? Look in verse 4. He says the marriage, marriage is to be honored by all. The synonyms in some of your translations are going to do things like it's to be valued. It's to be respected. It's to be, translations don't do this, but the parallel idea would be like deemed precious esteemed best to think of it as like a, a treasured possession your grandfather leaves you a bible and it's got handwritten notes throughout that testify to his journey with the lord it's a bible like everybody has a bible but this one's precious it's prized by you 
of all the things that you would be fine replacing if someone broke into your house and stole stuff or a fire burned it down, the preciousness of that object is unique. You can replace clothes all day, but you can't replace that. He says, treat marriage that way. And specifically treat your marriage that way. It's not a grin and bear it notion. It's not a, I've got to honor my commitment and just stick it out. Rather, it's find the gift of marriage worthy. Find it valuable. Find the person that you married precious. Elsewhere in the New Testament, this language, 1 Peter, it's you, the precious stones that God is building into this spiritual house. The book of Revelation, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus himself. Like, it's a significantly potent word. Precious. And note in verse 5, it's not just that you are passively satisfied or that you are passively finding your marriage precious but it's a command verse 5 be satisfied you're called to do something so friends let me lean into us all a bit you play an active role in cultivating satisfaction both in your marriage and in your stuff and here's a danger you can avoid overt sexual sin and still not cultivate singular affection for your spouse. You can avoid overt materialism and greed and still not cultivate generous stewardship of your resources. The, the ditch on the don't do side is sometimes we can tend to think, well, if I'm not doing, then I'm good, right? Well, it's not merely avoidance, but it's embracing. Be satisfied. Be fulfilled, Proverbs 5. Drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in the streets, streams in the public squares, they should be for you alone, not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain be blessed. Take pleasure in the wife of your youth, a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. And just as an aside, if this verse brings out the middle school giggles in you, um, we got Song of Solomon to go uh, in a, about a month. You ain't seen nothing yet, friends, all right? So you might as well get all your middle school giggles out of the way uh, here because uh, it's about to get worse. Um, <laughs> be satisfied. I think as we consider the rampant rebellion in areas of sexual sin and gender, divorce, homosexuality. One of the best means we as a church have of pressing against the moral chaos in our culture is found here. It's working to build the kinds of one man, one woman commitment until death that we can be proud of. It's living uniquely distinct marriages in this world. And friends, you will not drift here. You won't get there. You will, you will not passively meander yourself to deep affection at your 50th wedding celebration. It, it just won't happen. Nor will you magically retire and find that your death grip on your stuff releases. It just won't happen. We simply can't get complacent here. And perhaps this is, this is the real danger, isn't it, with familiarity. We tend, tend to equate, I, I think it's wrong, I think it's broken. Familiarity equals uh, contempt. I don't, I don't think that's the biggest danger. I think it's familiarity equals complacency. Familiarity equals complacency. And the idea gets applied to our money as well. He says, be content. A far cry from complacent. Don't be complacent, but be content. Be content in the stuff that you have. Paul got here. Remember Philippians 4? I don't say this out of need. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. 
I know how to make do with a little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Like, that's the famous eye black verse, right, Un under football players' helmets. It's, but all things that I can do is I can be content. Why? The text gives us two reasons, verses 5 and 6. The Lord is with you. He'll never leave you. It's framed here. He'll never forsake you. It's the image of a shepherd. It's like the shepherd would never walk off and just leave a sheep in a desolate place to get destroyed. So like he's never gonna leave, he's never gonna turn his back on you and just like, oh, where's Matt? And the Lord will help you. He will come to your aid. He's with you and he will come to your aid. The Psalms, your, your Bibles are gonna do all kinds of little superscripts there because it's all over the Psalms. Psalm 27, Psalm 118, the Lord is my helper the Lord is for me. I will not be afraid. Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord is the one who will go with you. He will never leave you or abandon you. I mean, he could have just quoted Psalm 23 here, couldn't he? The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his namesake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I don't fear any danger. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So why can you be content? Because the Lord is with you, Christian, and he will help you. I actually think those ideas are bound more tightly together than that conjunction. The Lord is with you and he will help you. I, th I think it's more tight. The Lord is with you so he will help you. The Lord is there. He is present with you. He will never leave you, so he will come to your aid. It's a picture of a little kid at the playground with mom. From a child's perspective, there's all sorts of danger and risk and fear and failure there, right? But mom's there. And since she's with you, she's going to help you. She's going to care for you so you can be content. All the scrambling and striving and straining, you can rest in the fact that God will care for you. This is a hard point, satisfaction, contentment. It's a hard point to make sticky with marriage. I don't, I don't have a way to know if you're satisfied in your marriage. I mean, I can kind of tell if you're dissatisfied in your marriage. But there's no, like, measuring stick there. So I'm going to use the illustration um, regarding uh, generosity. And there's a danger here as a pastor to use this as an illustration because a new person that comes to our church might, uh, this one, could reinforce the common notion that, you know, all a church talks about is money. They just want your stuff. Rest assured, if you're new with us, um, if we err on the side of this, it is under talking about money and not over talking about it. Okay. Um, and you might temp be tempted to think, Matt's sizing me up. He was looking right at me when he said this. I, I don't know what individuals give to our church. I don't have any names attached to these numbers. So any meddling that's being done and what I'm about to share is being done by the Spirit and not by me, okay? And last caveat, I'm aware that giving through the church is not the only way that you can be generous. But it is a good indicator. In, in my years, it's been uniquely unlikely for someone to be resistant to being generous to the church who is overwhelmingly generous outside of the church. So our giving patterns to our local assembly do say something about our hearts. So think with me about our church budget for a minute. Monthly, it takes about $160,000 to do what we do as a church. Ministry, mission, facilities, staffing, and the like. 
In our church, we have about 200 member giving units, families, couples in our church. Of those 200 giving units, we have 50 that haven't given anything in the last year to the local assembly. And roughly half that have given less than $1,000 to the church. The average giving to our local assembly is just in excess of $4,000 per giving unit. Were we using the old standard of a tithe, which I don't think is a New Testament standard, but that would assume that the average annual income of our church is somewhere around $50,000 annually. We can make the same observations regarding our one mission giving. This is the means by which our church supports our one mission partners around the world. Our current goal is $270,000. Right now we have approximately 90,000 of that pledged. But that 90,000 has been pledged by 33 of our member giving units which means roughly 170 of our member giving units uh, have not committed to give anything at this point. Now, in a previous small group I attended at our church, we would start the group by sharing highs and lows. Go around and everybody would say, this is one thing that I'm really encouraged by, this is one challenge that I've had. And there was this one dude in the group, and he was notorious for being unwilling to share a low. You'd come to him, he'd be like, uh, I had a bunch of highs, didn't really have a low, but I had a couple of ways that I can trust God this week, right? I just had a few ways that I need to grow in faith. Well, I might frame these generosity numbers as a low, as a pastor. But let's use his language. These are great opportunities for us to grow in faith. Imagine what would happen. To the numbers that I just referenced, if everyone took one step forward in generosity, if those 50 of you who are not giving, if you just engaged, friends, we're running a $2 million budget here. What that means is we have some radically generous people in our body. But we have a lot of people who are drafting off of the radical generosity of others and not engaged in the work. So if those who are not giving engaged, if those who had, like me, set their giving and forgotten it, if you just reevaluated this afternoon, said, is what we're currently doing a model of generosity and training us to not love our stuff? If those who were giving minimalistically <clears throat> sought God and grew, if those who were giving faithfully stretched themselves to trust God for sacrificial generosity, could happen. Uh, in two weeks in the December 1st family meeting, we're going to share with you what we, we think may be some tentative plans to what to do with this facility and what the future holds for our church. And friends, those decisions that the elders make in back rooms are predicated on the radical generosity of our church. They depend on you. But more than that, you need to ge be generous more than we need you to be generous. You need to be generous more than, and, and I need to be generous more than the church needs my generosity. Look in verse 5 again. Keep your life free from the love of money. Here again, an active role that you play. You've got to do something that keeps your life free from the rotting effect that money will have on your soul. And so the best way to keep yourself free from loving money is to play hot potato with it. It's to redistribute it to the needs of others and the advance of God's mission in the world through the church. That's the only Because if you, if, you, if you hold on to it too long, you're going to get consumed with it. So you got to play hot potato with it. Got to keep your life free from it, which presses me to where we started. Do you really believe that God gives good gifts to his kids? God gives good gifts to his kids. Those people find satisfaction in the good gifts. They say, I can be content at the stage and the station of life that God has me, and I can trust him to re-steward my resources and advance them. I don't have to look outside of my marriage because I can be satisfied with the marriage that I have. Why? Because God gives good gifts to his kids. Let me say it precisely. Whatever you have right now 
has been given to you by God for your good and his glory. He does not need you to get to the next station of life to be able to leverage your life for, his, for your good and his glory. Whatever you have right now, wherever you are right now. So, I mean, anticipating the objection, you may have found yourself thinking, man, Matt, that all sounds great, but dude, I'm single. And I've got limited resources. Is there anything in Hebrews 13, 4 through 6 for me? You better believe it. You are always, church, you are always cultivating satisfaction or dissatisfaction in your life. I don't care what's your station in life. You're always cultivating satisfaction or dissatisfaction. So think with me for a second. How can you be satisfied with what you have even if you don't have what you wish you had? How can you be satisfied with what you have even if you don't have what you wish you had? And just as that header shows up on the screen, doesn't that allow you to say, like, everyone's in on this, aren't we? I mean, it might not be in the area of marriage. It might not be in the area of job. But there's something hovering in all of our lives that we wish we had that we don't currently have. Children we wish we had, but we can't. A job we wish we had, but we don't. A tragedy we wish we could erase, but we can't. A relational status we'd love to change, but we can't. What do you do? What do we all do? You give thanks for the good gifts you do experience. You learn to grow in giving God thanks for whatever he has given you. None of you, none of you have 0% of good gifts from a good God evidenced in your life. You might not have the gift you wish you had, but it doesn't mean you don't have the blessing of God demonstrated in your life. So start to give thanks for those things. Invest in the relationships and resources you do have. Be a good friend. Give something. Even if it doesn't feel like much to you, be a widow's mite kind of person. Train yourself to give something. Three, cultivate commitment. Not contentment, but commitment. You want to be a one uh, woman kind of man or one man kind of woman, cultivate doing what you say you'll do now. Even if you're not in those relationships. Keep your word. Be faithful to your promises even when you don't want to anymore. Celebrate. Don't begrudge God's good gifts in the lives of others. Celebrate and don't begrudge God's good gifts in the lives of others. When that friend gets engaged and you wish it was you, celebrate God's good gifts in the life of other people. And then fifthly, develop relationships with content people a life stage in front of you. Cozy up and get to know some people who are doing verse 5 well. They're satisfied with the things that God has given. Find some marriages that you hope yours is going to be like when it grows up. Get to know those people. Find some people who are not consumed with stuff and ask them how they give, how they train their hearts. Watch what they do with their money. And here's what happens. It's where we started. It's where Matt led us. Psalm 103. He satisfies you with good things. And your youth gets renewed like the eagles. This truth, Psalm 103, I'd encourage you to reread it this afternoon. Because it's not just applicable to married couples or people that have a lot of stuff. The psalmist's words are applicable to all people at every life stage. It's true for us. All people, God is satisfying us with good things, and our youth can be renewed like the eagle. When you find satisfaction in these things, particularly in the areas of marriage and money, you testify to the reality of the book of Hebrews. Actually, your marriage and money re-preaches the book of Hebrews. You say with your life, Jesus is better. It's not just you are satisfied with the good things, Psalm 103, but he satisfies you with good things. It's not just you have strength like an eagle, but he gives you strength like an eagle. Done well 
satisfaction and sanctification point to a savior. Satisfaction and sanctification point to a savior. Our marriages can testify to that. Our money can testify to that. Our very lives can testify to that. And people both inside and outside can look in and say, that person gets the gospel. Let's pray to that end this morning. Plenty of room for the spirit to meddle in your heart. So let me give you the space to pray. Then I'll voice a prayer for us. And then one of the pastors will come and lead us to the Lord's table. Father, as we pray in this space, I'm just reminded of the heaviness of these themes as it relates to just the complexity of the eyes that are, that are listening to my words this morning. The pain and difficulty and uh, self-condemnation and guilt we can feel, feel in these areas. The weight that we can walk out with. We thank you that we who are in Christ have hope. That we have hope that our past handlings of these areas are not defining for our future. That your spirit can be active and at work and bring transformation in us and through us. We thank you for the glorious privilege that that is seen in these areas where, where we get to preach sermons like every, all the time. We get to testify to whether we actually believe that Jesus is better in these ways. We need your help to do it. We, we acknowledge that it is far easier for us to say that we believe Jesus is better than it is to demonstrate it with our lives and our marriages and our money. And so would you help us to translate what we say to be true about the world to the practical choices that we make with our lives? Would you embolden us for that work, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes there are 